Let's listen into the White House press briefing room. Press Secretary Corinne Jean-Pierre. Bring your loved ones home where they belong. And with that, I will turn it over to our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. Thank you, Corrine, and good afternoon, everyone. Today, as you've seen and heard from the President and from Corrine, we've completed one of the largest and certainly the most complex exchange in history. And Paul Whelan, Evan Gershkovich, Alsu Kermasheva, and Vladimir Karamurza, three American citizens and one American green card holder, are finally coming home. I have the honor and pleasure of joining the President this morning in the Oval Office as he shared the wonderful news with the families. And then together, they spoke with Paul, Evan, Alsu, and Vladimir, who were on the tarmac in Ankara with U.S. officials where the exchange happened. To say that everyone in the room was overjoyed, even at a loss for words, is an understatement. Since taking office, President Biden and Vice President Harris have made clear that they will not stop working until every American wrongfully detained or held hostage around the world is reunited with their family. As an administration, we're proud to celebrate the return home of over 70 such Americans from places around the world like Afghanistan, Burma, Gaza, Haiti, Iran, Russia, Venezuela, Rwanda, and elsewhere. Today's exchange is a feat of diplomacy that honestly could only be achieved by a leader like Joe Biden. At his direction, the professionals in our national security, foreign policy, and intelligence community worked tirelessly and relentlessly to secure the release of 16 individuals who were detained in Russia. The three American citizens, one American green car holder, five German citizens, and seven Russian political prisoners in exchange for eight individuals held in a combination of the United States, Germany, Norway, Slovenia, and Poland. The, pre the President was himself personally engaged in the diplomacy that brought this about, including multiple conversations with Chancellor Schultz, with the other leaders of the countries who uh, provided some of the Russians as part of the exchange, and most recently, as has now been reported, calling the Prime Minister of Slovenia early in the afternoon of Sunday, July 21st, to coordinate the final arrangements, to make the final piece of this deal fall into place. There is no more singular or concrete demonstration that the alliances that the President has reinvigorated around the world matter to Americans, to the individual safety of Americans, and to the collective security of Americans. And we're deeply grateful to our allies who supported us in these complex negotiations to achieve this outcome. And while I'm standing at this podium, the President is reaching out to give personal thanks uh, to the leaders of Germany, Poland, Slovenia, Norway, and Turkey. And honestly, guys, I can just say this was vintage Joe Biden, rallying, Amer rallying American allies to save American citizens and Russian freedom fighters and doing it with intricate statecraft, pulling his whole team together to drive this across the finish line. ...who are enduring an unimaginable ordeal. From the president on down, we've stayed in regular and routine touch with them. I spent a lot of time with the families uh, of Evan and Paul and also. Most of the time, as you can imagine, those are tough conversations. But not today. Today, excuse me, um, today was a very good day. And we're going to build on it, uh, drawing inspiration and con continued courage from it uh, for all of those who are held hostage or wrongfully detained around the world. And that includes Mark Fogel, who we are actively working uh, to get his release from Russia as well. And there are others being held in Syria, Afghanistan, other countries around the world who we are working to get released. And just on a personal note, I want to say that this is the culmination of a monumental level of effort and level of skill by my teammates across the national security enterprise. My colleagues here at the NSC, my colleagues at the Central Intelligence Agency, my colleagues at the State Department. These are dedicated, talented professionals who are not in the headlines, who don't get to stand at a podium like this one. And it was at the president's direction that they built and pulled off the most intricate, expansive deal of its kind in memory. So they know who they are. I salute them. And every American should be proud to have those kind of people standing up uh, on their behalf and on behalf of American security. While this has unfolded, we've been closely monitoring the events in the Middle East as well. Since October 7th, we have worked to deter and prevent escalation into a wider regional war. That risk has always been there. That risk is there now. 
and we are determined to engage in deterrence, defense, and de-escalation uh, to try to ensure that we do not have a wider uh, regional conflict or escalation that goes unchecked. So I'm happy to get more into that in response to your questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Jake. Whose idea was it to try to go big and bring everyone home at once instead of going for a simpler one-for-one -one type deal and walk? That's a great question, um, which I don't feel entirely comfortable answering because this was an organic process involving a lot of people across our government. Uh, but what I will say is this. The president sat us down on a regular basis over the course of the detentions of Paul, Evan, and Alsu and really pushed us to think about what configuration would actually work to make this happen. And it was through an iterative, iterative process of back and forth with various of the allies I mentioned, with engagements with our Russian counterparts, where we were making proposals, um, getting responses, that this all came together. And so I would say that if you had not had Joe Biden sitting in the Oval Office, I don't think this would have happened. Uh, but as I said in my remarks, there were a lot of other people who played a central role in building out the pieces of this and then executing on that. And the execution phase of this to get this level of coordination together, to have those planes all land on the tarmac at the same time from multiple different countries with so many different individuals coming from Russia and going back to Russia, uh, really extraordinary. And I think, you know, team effort can be a cliche, but I think in this case it's a warranted uh, description of what happened. And was Alexei Navalny supposed to be a part of this deal before he died in prison? So we had been working with our partners on uh, a deal that would have included Alexei Navalny. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he died. Um, in fact, on the very day that he died, I saw Evan's parents. And I told them that the president was determined to get this done, even in light of that tragic news, and that we were going to work uh, day and night to get to this day. Um, and so that work continued over the course of the past few months and culminated in today. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that a little bit, but can you describe and give us a little bit more color on that Oval Office conversation just before the president came out? Did all four Americans get to speak? Did, did each of the family members get to speak to their loved ones? Did the president tear up? Did you tear up? <laughs> I saved my tearing up for this podium. <laughs> I, w I would like to strike that from the record. If it be, is that, I don't know if that's permitted. Probably not. Um, so uh, the president invited the family members in at the moment that uh, we received the word from the tarmac in Ankara that the exchange was complete. And he was able to give them the news directly that the exchange was, in fact, complete. Then um, Paul, Evan, and Alsu uh, were in one place. Vladimir was actually in another place. So he conducted two calls from the Oval Office, one with the three American citizens on the phone, and he um, welcomed their freedom, said, you know, uh, that on behalf of the American people, he was so proud to have them out, and then very quickly turned the phone over to their family members, and each family got the opportunity to engage by phone um, with their loved one who was out. He then conducted a second call with Vladimir, and Vladimir's uh, wife, uh, one of their daughters, and uh, their son were there to be able to speak with him and the president, and he also uh, got to reminisce on the fact that they were both pallbearers together at John McCain's wedding, uh, wedding uh, John McCain's funeral. Um, and so it was a, a kind of extraordinary personal exchange in the Oval Office, and the family members were both overwhelmed, of course, by the events of the day and also standing there in the presen presence of the U.S. president at the Resolute desk. So um, it, it was quite a moment. And can you talk about um, how the administration tries to um, make sure this doesn't incentivize more arrests of innocent Americans beyond what the president said, advising people not to go to abroad, not to go abroad in certain places, especially because you're looking at this inherent imbalance between releasing uh, or between securing the release of innocent American in exchange for rightfully convicted criminals, including a murder. Look, it's a fair question. It's a question that we grapple with every time that we look at the hard decisions involved in one of these exchanges. Um, it is difficult to send back a convicted criminal uh, 
to secure the release of an innocent American. And yet, sometimes the choice is between doing that and consigning that person basically to live out their days in prison in a hostile foreign country or in the hands of um, uh, a hostile power. So from our perspective, uh, we have assessed and analyzed that risk, and we have judged that the benefit of reuniting Americans, of bringing people home, and also of vindicating the idea that the American government are going to do what it takes to protect and secure the release of innocent Americans, that that benefit outweighs the risk, and that's how we have proceeded. I would point out, in addition to that, that in periods of time when the U.S. government didn't tend to do prisoner exchanges, Americans were unjustly detained and held hostage overseas. In periods where we did, Americans were unjustly detained and held hostage overseas. So I think there are real questions, and, and Roger Karstens, the hostage negotiator at the State Department, has actually pointed out that in this analysis, it is not quite as clear cut that the evidence actually demonstrates uh, the kind of result that your question speaks to, um, that, you know, a lot more people get taken because we do these exchanges. But it's something that we have to pay attention to, and it's something that makes these decisions by the President not simple decisions, hard decisions, and yet, as he did today, he was prepared to make them. Yeah. Can you explain a bit more, when did it become clear that Krasikov was this linchpin to a deal like this, and was it during the negotiations over Brittany Griner? When you're engaged in a negotiation and one side lays down a position, there's not like a, a light bulb moment when you say, okay, that position is immovable. That has to be tested and alternatives have to be suggested and proposals get put on the table and rejected, and new proposals and rejected. So it is less of a aha moment, okay, uh, now we know, and it's more something that you accumulate through the experience of the negotiation. And so over the course of this negotiation, we did reach the conclusion that Krasikov was a key. You've discussed, obviously, the president's involvement, direct involvement in all of this. Can you talk us through any involvement that the vice president had? Was she also uh, speaking directly to other leaders and allies? So uh, as I said in my opening comments, both President Biden and Vice President Harris have made the return of unjustly detained Americans hostage, uh, American hostages an absolute priority. And in this particular case, uh, Vice President Harris actually had an opportunity to engage with Chancellor Schultz earlier this year at an opportune and timely moment at the Munich Security Conference uh, where she talked about this issue with him. Um, that followed on a conversation that the President had just a short time before that, and it was in the run of high-level engagements and a back and forth that the President and the Chancellor were having that Vice President Harris was actually able to sit face-to-face -face with Chancellor Schultz uh, and talk through the elements of this. And then I've sat in the Oval Office more times than I can count over the course of the past years, um, providing briefings and updates on this and getting peppered with questions by both the President and the Vice President, um, thinking through the strategy, iterating the approach, um, which she was a participant in uh, very much, a core member of the team that helped make this happen. Yeah. Two quick questions. One is it relates to the President's interactions with Chancellor Scholz. It's been detailed to us, but maybe from the podium, if you could help us understand. Chancellor Scholz had to make a big sacrifice giving up Krasikov here, a Russian criminal. What specifically did the German Chancellor say to President Biden about his willingness to do this? Well, I will leave that to Chancellor Scholz because I think for, you know, important and sensitive conversations, uh, leaders should uh, speak for themselves. The White House said he said for you, and then he said, I will do this. Is that fair? And if so, can you at least detail that? I can confirm that he did say that, but I thought you were asking sort of to elaborate in greater detail, which I just, I'm afraid I don't feel comfortable doing because he can, he can speak to his conversations with the president. What I will say, and, and President Biden made this point when uh, he spoke to the press just a short time ago, um, that relationship between the president and the chancellor, a relationship of respect, a relationship of, of genuine friendship, um, had the character of being able to work through this sensitive issue in a way that wasn't antiseptic or professional. It was two guys actually trying to figure out a solution. That was the nature of all of the conversations, and ultimately the chancellor was able to say to the president, let's do this. Just to be clear, my second question, today is clearly a day of celebration, but already there is some criticism, including from 
the Republican vice presidential nominee, J.D. Vance, who moments ago said, I think what this demonstrates, I think that really what this shows is that a lot of bad guys across the world are worried that Donald Trump is coming back into office. Your response to those comments? I don't follow. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Can you talk about what, if any, engagement the U.S. officials had with Vladimir Putin as part of this? Uh, no engagement directly with Vladimir Putin. What about his deputies? There was extensive engagement with Russian officials over the course of this. I'm not going to get into the details because those channels are sensitive and need to be protected for exactly this reason, because having those sensitive channels enables us to produce results like today. And then today. last week in the Oval Office, President Biden said that he remains committed to bringing Americans home uh, during his final six months in office. How important was it for him to get this deal before leaving office? Honestly, I don't think he was thinking about it like, I got to get it before I'm, I leave office. He was thinking about it from the family's perspective, which is every day is a lost day. So I want to do this as rapidly as humanly possible. Uh, I want to push the pace on it because the longer that these Americans are held abroad, the, the greater the risk and the greater the pain. So for him, it was really important to do the deal, but less tied to his time in office and more tied to the power and responsibility he had and wanted to exercise to get this done as fast as he possibly could. Yeah. I just want to follow up on, on this interaction with the Russians. I mean, does this in any way lay any groundwork for discussions about the war in Ukraine with the Ukrainians? I mean, just to sort of say, look, we've cooperated on this. Is there any path that this creates any sort of goodwill in terms of, you know, creating more discussions? We do not see a link between the hostage negotiation or the, the de detained persons negotiations and any potential diplomacy over the war in Ukraine. We see those as operating on separate tracks. Uh, one is really about the practical issue of producing this exchange. The other is a much more complex question uh, where the Ukrainians will be in the lead and the United States will consult closely with all of our allies to support them when they are prepared to step forward and engage in those uh, in that kind of diplomacy. Yep. Can, I, can I just follow up on, so we, we can't have you here and not ask you what was happening and unfolding in the Middle East um, and with Iran and with this, uh, the, the killing of Hania. Can you please just give us your assessment of how high the temperature really is and how great the risks are now of an all-out war or a bigger war? Just taking a step back, um, we have been laser focused on trying to prevent that wider war since October 7th. Uh, there have been moments that have required intensive effort to keep a lid on things. Uh, the risk has always been there, and the risk remains today. And we believe we do have to be engaging in intensive efforts now through deterrence, through de escalation, through diplomacy. Uh, to prevent a wider war, and we will continue to do that. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Jake. Uh, back in May, former President Trump made the comment that Russia would release Evan Gershkovich for him after the upcoming le election, quote, but not for anyone else. Did that comment uh, complicate uh, negotiations at all, and do you have a response to Trump's comment now? Look, I'm just happy these guys are out and home, and I won't wade into the comments of the former president. Yeah. What about Jimmy Wilgus? Are you working on him? Yeah. Jake, you noted that the president spoke to the leader of Slovenia right around the time he was making his decision on his political future. How much was the, 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 the thinking that he had to go through on his, on his future part of this process leading up to these negotiations? Was this something that weighed on him for, for days ahead of these calls? I, look. To be honest with you, the way in which this unfolded played out over the course of weeks, even months, to put all of the pieces in place. So um, the timing and the cadence of the different elements coming together, the feature of the diplomacy and the decision-making of each of the countries involved, it wasn't about American politics, the American political calendar, or presidents thinking on other issues. And it did happen to line up on that Sunday in that way, but not through a conscious decision to make it so, but rather because that's when the pieces were falling into place. And that's the moment when the president had to drop that final piece in. 
uh, and it just so happened to come a couple of hours before he made his announcement. And when do you think we will actually see them on American soil? Will the president greet them in person? I think uh, you can expect to see uh, Evan, Paul, and all Sue later tonight on American soil. Um, and uh, as the president mentioned in his remarks earlier, they'll be landing at Andrews Air Force Base. Um, the president and the vice president will be out there to greet them. Vladimir uh, Karamurza is going to be traveling to Germany, um, and his family, who was here with the president this morning, will be traveling there to join him. But as uh, Vladimir and the president discussed today, we expect him back here in the United States soon for him to be able to see the president and, uh, and other people in the U.S. government. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Uh, switching gears for a moment, I want to ask you about the uh, e deal uh, that was reached with 9 uh, 11 suspects by uh, military in military courts down in Guantanamo. Uh, Republicans are condemning this as uh, showing weakness and calling it a, a sweetheart deal because it avoids a uh, trial and the death penalty. Uh, I was wondering if the administration has any response to that. As we said last night, the White House received word that the convening authority had entered these pretrial agreements that had been negotiated by military prosecutors with KSM and some of the other 9-11 defendants. And uh, we had no role in that process. The president had no role. The vice president had no role. I had no role. Had no role. And we were informed yesterday, the same day that they went out publicly, that this uh, uh, pre-trial agreement had been accepted uh, by the convening authority. What the president did upon learning of that was direct his team to consult as appropriate with officials and lawyers at the Department of Defense on this matter. Those consultations are ongoing, and I have nothing more to add at this time. And one, yeah. one, one more thing. On, uh, on Iran, uh, Israel, Hamas negotiations, uh, now that the lead Hamas negotiator is, is dead, who is there to negotiate with, and, and why, why, in your estimation, would Hamas continue towards negotiating a, a ceasefire deal when their lead negotiator was just killed by the people they're negotiating with? It is too soon to tell what the impact of his death uh, will have on the negotiations, uh, and so I'm not going to speculate on that especially in light of the broader dynamics and set of events unfolding in the region right now. What I will say is this. The ceasefire and hostage deal is the pathway to ending this war. It is the pathway to getting all of the hostages home, including the American citizen hostages who are relentlessly focused on getting home. And we remain determined to get it done. Yeah. yeah um, did the president have a call today with Prime Minister Netanyahu, or is he having one? Uh, I, I believe the uh, Israeli government has put out that they're having a call. We had not announced that yet, but in fact, uh, the president is intending to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu later today. They have not spoken yet. Yeah. And, and is the president going to um, express any displeasure about not having a heads up about uh, the the attack on the Hamas leader or these other big things that have happened uh, in in the last few days uh, with Israel taking countermeasures. So I'm not going to preview the president's message before he has a chance to speak directly to the prime minister. And then if I had to predict, I probably will be tight-lipped about the readout afterward. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jeff. I just wondered if you could make clear for us when was the actual moment when you really knew that this deal was was going to be done and that it was sealed, or was that not really until today and you actually saw them? Uh, the, the released people on the, on the tarmac and, uh, and anchor. We steadily gained confidence uh, following the president's call on the, on the 21st of July, um, but that confidence was always tempered by the reality that this was a fragile deal, a complex deal that could fall apart at any moment from multiple different directions. So we held our breath and crossed our fingers until just a couple hours ago. Yeah. Jake, I wanted to ask about arms control treaties. It seems like Russia's been backsliding when it comes to these deals. Uh, what is the update with that? Is there any progress with getting them to rejoin any of these treaties? Uh, no. Uh, the short answer is there is no progress. Gage, uh, and I have publicly stated, and my colleagues have um, also laid out our view that there is an arms control agenda that's in the interests of the security of the United States, our allies, and frankly, global stability. Uh, and we have not seen reciprocity on the Russian side to engage in those discussions at this time. 
So we're obviously working very closely with NATO, with our other allies and partners, to ensure that our security is going to be strong, resilient, and credible no matter what comes next. But we do remain available to engage in arms control, as we did with the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. Uh, last question. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. Can you just confirm that no money was exchanged, no sanctions were loosened to facilitate this deal? Yes, I can confirm that. And can you also speak to why the president chose not to use his moment in front of the cameras to deliver a warning to Putin? He said, I don't need to speak to Putin. But what he didn't convey was a price that countries will pay if they abduct Americans for political purposes. We have made clear uh, through every conceivable channel, and the president has made clear publicly on repeated occasions over the last two years about the costs and consequences of aggression, standing against United States interests, and of taking actions that uh, we believe are unlawful and unjust. We're going to continue to do that as we go forward. For the president today, this was a moment to thank our allies. It was a moment to celebrate the families. And most importantly, it was a moment to lift up uh, the human achievement of getting both Americans, um, citizens of friendly countries, and Russian political prisoners out. Uh, but as the president said, he doesn't need to talk to Putin for Putin to understand where the president stands. Thank you.